This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. Tolkien wrote a lot of stuff outside of just The Lord of the Rings, and a lot of it has been published. From his letters to Father Christmas to his translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Tolkien has published so many essays, poems, collections, short stories, and of course, major novels. And today I am going to do my best to rank them. Now you may notice that there is a, a very specifically chosen almost in our title here, and that's so that people can't get mad at me for not doing every single thing he's written. But I'm gonna try and hit most of his major works, as well as some of his more obscure ones, in the hopes of guiding anyone who hasn't read them into what they might want to read next, and, you know, just getting to talk about all of these Tolkien works in comparison to each other. So, let's get into it. Okay, so I can't do this on a computer, like most people would, where you, like, sort them out in real time, because, um, I'm in my garage, and my laptop is broken. Well, it's not broken, it's just just not, it's not well. So I'm gonna be doing this uh, on paper and then sorting it out on the computer and recording that footage later. Our first tier is S for Sauron would hate this because uh, it's so great that the major force of evil in Middle Earth would be really mad if he read them. A is for Aragorn's kind of thing, because he probably has good taste because he's the, the king of Gondor. B is for... I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like this is falling apart already. Dylan and I brainstormed what each of these tiers would be for like a solid half hour the other week, but that was the other week and it's today and I can't remember what we said. So the rest of the tiers are B, C, D, E, and F, F being the worst. Let's get ranking. Let's begin with The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. This is a collection of poems. It wasn't published until the 60s, but it was written far earlier, especially because the character of Tom Bombadil is in them and he existed long before The Lord of the Rings and long before he was put into The Lord of the Rings. There are a couple of poems about Tom Bombadil himself and kind of his adventures through the wood. Tom Bombadil as a character is based off of a Dutch doll that Tolkien's child had and the adventures that this doll went on. You will notice in this tier list that a lot of these works were written for Tolkien's children. He wrote for his kids a lot and a lot of it got published and those are some of my favorite of his works. The rest of the poems that aren't about Tom Bombadil are kind of bestiary, uh, walking us through the various creatures of the woods, you know, very poetic, very fun. I enjoy the adventures of Tom Bombadil. It is not my favorite favorite, but I think that it is a little bit limited because it is poetry and it's very Tolkienian poetry. The problem here is that I'm gonna want to rate everything really high because I like Tolkien, believe it or not, but I can't do that. So some of these are gonna get ranked lower than you would want them to. I'm gonna put The Adventures of Tom Bombadil for now in a C tier. It is good and enjoyable, but it's not like the best thing that I've ever read. It has not changed my life. Next up, we have Mr. Bliss, which is one that I read recently, and it is very much a new favorite of mine. It's about a guy named Mr. Bliss who goes to buy his new car, and he wears funky hats and has something at home called a jarabbit, which is, as you might gather from the name, a rabbit with a giraffe's neck and everything goes wrong in the buying of this car. He loses his bike, he crashes into a cart full of cabbages, he gets held up by a gang of bears, he falls into a soup tureen. It is a whole mess. Very fun story. It is illustrated by Tolkien and handwritten out by Tolkien, which is very fun because I love Tolkien's illustrations. And you can tell that it was sort of pieced together. You know, there are parts where he has an arrow saying the car is over here, but I got tired of drawing it. So fun. I want to own a paper copy so that I can do a reading on this channel or maybe on my Patreon. Check out the link in the description. We also find some like weird Lord of the Rings references, even though this isn't in the Lord of the Rings universe where it's like he has a character named Gaffer Gamgee. Very quick read. I cannot recommend it enough. I know it's just because I read this recently and I'm very excited about it that I'm ranking this as high as I am, but that's gonna go in the A tier. Next up in a total mood shift, we have the Children of Húrin, which tells the story of Túrin Túrumbar as his family is cursed and and, and a lot of stuff happens to him. This is where we find the dragon at Glaurung. His sister has her memories wiped and then he does marry her and impregnate her. And then she um, uh, removes herself from this plane of mortal existence. And he also 
uh, ends up being removed from the plane of mortal existence. Sorry, I'm trying to censor myself for YouTube, sort of. Not that I don't talk about death on here all the time, but The Children of Houdin is mostly compiled from his notes, but Christopher Tolkien has published a whole compendium of his notes and bits of Children of Houdin where you can get the whole story. And it is very grim, very dark. It's kind of, I would say, his Game of Thrones equivalent, just with like the incest and the darkness, but it's not really the greatest comparison, but it's what a lot of people say probably one of his darkest works. It does hurt to read because it's very dark and very sad and no one's happy, but I guess that's what happens when you are cursed. I'm gonna put The Children of Hooden at a B. I feel like people are gonna get mad at this no matter how I rank it, so, you know, tell me what your rankings would be in the comments. Next, we have Tolkien's Letters from Father Christmas. I did a full video reading through these on the channel a couple Christmases ago, which is a very long video, but a very fun one in my opinion. It's good to have on in the background. It's not really the season anymore, but I will link that if you want to check that out. His letters from Father Christmas span from around the 20s to the 40s when his children were young and growing up, and it's a compilation of the letters that he wrote to them from Father Christmas. And so it tells the story of what's happening at the North Pole as he's trying to get their presents ready. There is a lovely character called the Polar Bear, and they go on so many adventures and misadventures. It's funny because even in these letters that he's writing to his kids and illustrating, there's beautiful illustrations, you can tell that he can't help but world build and insert bits and pieces of his legendarium into every single thing he writes. The polar bear writes in runes at one point. There's some other really fun little Lord of the Rings references, but really it's just his larger legendarium seeping into everything he does. It is a little bit sad though, because you are watching his kids grow up through these letters and you know, suddenly one kid isn't there this year, or one kid didn't write to Father Christmas. And as they're getting older, very nostalgic, very sweet. It does make me cry to read. Okay, I'm gonna put this in C but it's not because I don't love it. It's just because there are certain things that have been published under the Tolkien name that like, it skeeves me out a little bit that they're published and like obviously, for the most part, Christopher Tolkien decided to publish these, which is his prerogative, it's his father's writing. And the letters from Father Christmas is one of those things where it almost feels a little bit too intimate that I'm getting these letters from a father to his children, like a Christmas time tradition. Like I'm honored that they shared this with us, but I also, it feels a little invasive on my part sometimes to be reading these. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but we're gonna put that in C. It's also, you know, continuity isn't great, but it's also um, not meant to be a story. So I guess that's why it's in C, Tolkien never intended it for publication in the first place. Next up, we have Smith of Wooten Major. This is another one that I did a reading of on the channel, and it's very, very delightful. It tells the story of a boy named Smith from the village of Wooten Major, and he finds a little star that allows him to travel into the land of fairy. As the story progresses, he eventually has to give up the star to hand it off to the next generation. It's one of his stories that you can tell is very allegorical, and that's kind of a bad word with Tolkien and someday I'll do a video talking about what he really meant when he said that he dislikes allegory but it's a super allegorical story. It talks about imagination and the ability of one to lose themselves in fantasy and children's story in fairy and how eventually we grow out of that and we have to move on and pass our imagination on to the next generation. It's a beautiful short story an incredible read. It made me cry I'm pretty sure but a lot of things make me cry. I don't know if I can rank anything low in this. It feels like I have to adjust for like inflation, but that's hard to do when you're the one ranking them. <sighs> Smith of Wooten Major, I enjoy it. It is compelling, it is good, but it is not his best. It is really good though. Ah! Something you may uh, gather from me while watching this video is that I'm really indecisive and I'm not good at critiquing things. That's why I, I analyze and I don't critique on this channel. We're doing a reshuffle. Adventures of Tom Bombadil is getting bumped down to a D. I'm sorry. Letters from Father Christmas can stay at a C and then Smith of Wooten Major is also gonna be a C. Okay, let's move on before I overthink that. But before we get on with that, I wanna talk to you about this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website building platform that lets you stand out and succeed online. They make it 
effortless to build yourself a beautiful website where you can connect with your audience, sell products, and make content all on your terms. And it has never been easier to connect with your audience than on your Squarespace site. You can use their blogging tool to share pictures, videos, and updates, and run your own email campaign to keep your people in the loop. And Squarespace's built-in analytics allow you to improve your website and build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or most popular products and content. Their professional website templates give you so many options to choose from, and they're all highly customizable so that your site can fit your aesthetic and your unique needs. Whether you're just starting out or you're ready to take your brand to the next level, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jess of the Shire to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. And thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors when I have them. Let's talk about something that is a definite mood change from Smith of Wooten Major, his essay Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics. This is probably one of his most important essays, and I need to get a physical copy of it because the fact that I don't have a physical copy of it means that I don't quote it in my videos as much as I do some of his other essays. It was, I believe, first given as a lecture and later published into a book, and it talks, as the title would imply, about Beowulf, but primarily the way that scholars at the time discussed Beowulf, because he believed that there was a tendency in academia to treat Beowulf as a relic, as something that only has historical value, to analyze, you know, what they said about the lifestyles that they lived at that time, that sort of thing. But Tolkien proposes in Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics, that we need to treat these ancient works of literature as if they are literature. We need to analyze them as poetry because they were poetry. And the story that these are telling, beyond just the details of what they say about everyday life for the clothing they were wearing, etc, etc, or the language, the story matters because the story tells us a lot about who they were and what they believed in. And the whole idea of it is the monsters and the critics. That as critics, you cannot ignore the monsters. Just because they are unreal, it doesn't mean we can ignore Grendel and Grendel's mother and the dragon. We cannot ignore nor these monsters because the people at the time created these monsters and that says something about them. So it's, I need to read it more thoroughly, obviously, but it is a very beautiful piece that can tell us a lot about what he saw as the importance of stories, especially historical stories. And this comes into play in the fact that the Lord of the Rings, as he originally intended it, is supposed to be a historical relic. He supposedly found the Red Book of Westmarch, where Frodo wrote all of this down, and translated it. And that's why you get the whole thing where it's like Frodo's name isn't really Frodo's name. The Lord of the Rings is framed as a historical relic, such as Beowulf. So an essay like this that talks about Tolkien's consideration of historical relics in the literary canon is very important. Okay, let's put Beowulf, the monsters, and the critics at B for Beowulf. Next, let's talk about the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. This is a book compiled by his official biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, and it compiles together a lot of the letters that he wrote to people, especially to fans and his publishers when it comes to clarifying details about the Lord of the Rings. It is a great resource. The editing by Humphrey Carpenter means that it has been edited. And I talked about this in a very uh, old video that I don't necessarily know if I would stand behind all of the points of it, but still, I talked about it there. Humphrey Carpenter has a lot of his own biases going into talking about Tolkien and especially compiling his works. So the original edition of his letters is not fully complete. There's a plane going overhead and it kind of sounds like it is coming right for me. That sounds like a straight up alien spaceship, but I'm, I may have just been watching too much Doctor Who lately. The original edition put out by Humphrey Carpenter is pretty heavily editorialized by him, but there was a version that came out just this last year, uh, November of 2023, that contains over a hundred more letters. So there is a revised and expanded version of Tolkien's letters coming out. And I think that that is probably somewhat more valuable than the original, and I haven't gotten the chance to read it, so I, I wouldn't personally know, but I am excited about that. There is so much valuable information in his letters. That's honestly my first point of research when I am starting on any Tolkien-centric videos. I just control F whatever the topic is and figure out what Tolkien said about it. There are a lot of great clarifying points he makes there. I wouldn't necessarily give this to someone as, you know, baby's first Tolkien. And so for that, and because I feel the need to have something on this list that is rated a little bit lower, I'm gonna put this in, you know what? 
I'm gonna put it in E, which is the closest I will probably get to F. Ugh, I feel bad doing that because it's one of my primary resources, but I'm sticking with it. Speaking of my primary resources, let's talk about On Fairy Stories, which is another essay by Tolkien. This was originally delivered as a lecture to a college by Tolkien, but has since been turned into a book. And it is an absolutely fabulous piece probably one of my favorites, if you haven't noticed by how much I bring it up. I see it as a sort of Bible for all of the ways in which he revolutionized fantasy. He talks about what fantasy is and what it is not. He talks about fantasy's relationship with children's stories. He talks about fantasy's ability to provide escapism, and more importantly, why that escapism is not a bad thing. It talks about his building of secondary worlds and the importance of good world building and really airtight secondary worlds that allow us to immerse ourselves. It talks about his religious connection to sub-creation, which was very, very very important in the way that he wrote fantasy. To me, this is probably the first thing that I would recommend people read when it comes to starting to dive deeper into Tolkien's scholarship, because I feel like it makes a lot of his writing make sense. It's like if you've had your refrigerator for, you know, 15 years and you've just been kind of getting by by like, you know, stumbling through replacing the filters or, you know, trying to clean out the ice maker as best you can, and then you read the manual and you realize that you never even took the plastic cling film from the outside of your stainless steel refrigerator. That is what reading On Fairy Stories feels like. Incidentally, he also has much better metaphors in On Fairy Stories than that metaphor I just gave, but um, I'm not the writer here, so. This is for me, S tier. None of this is without bias. This is all my own bias. So if you're gonna get mad at me for rating things stupidly, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, and it'll drive up engagement, so I can't really be mad. Next up, we have Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain, Gawain, it gets pronounced a lot of ways, and The Green Knight, which is another one that I did a reading of if you want to check that out. Tolkien's Sir Gawain and The Green Knight is a translation of a medieval tale originally written in Middle English, so it, it did need to be translated. Fun fact, after I did my video on Sir Gawain and The Green Knight where I learned how to pronounce a passage of Middle English, I learned how to say the introduction in Middle English, and it is still in my brain, and I can recite it at will, so. Sit in the sage and the assault what sayst at Troy. I am really fun at parties. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight tells the story of King Arthur's court at Christmas time, where they are looking for a good Christmas game to play, and then the doors burst open and a fully green horseman trots in, offering the best Christmas game of all, a game in which he says that anybody can hit him, hurt him however they want to, and then a year from then, he's gonna return the blow. So of course, the lusty Sir Gawain comes up and chops his head off, cause he's like, oh, this guy's gonna die, and then he can't come back and kill me. Decapitates the Green Knight, and then the Green Knight picks up his head and is like, okay, I'll, I'll see you in a year so I can return this blow. And Sir Gawain's like, oh shit. The story itself is pretty solid. It's definitely a medieval tale, and that comes with all of the good and all of the bad. The characters are not the depth of modern fiction. The plot is a little bit sticky and the pacing is a little bit weird, but Tolkien's translation of it is beautiful. He manages to maintain a lot of the alliteration from the original piece, which was very important to the structure of the original piece. So he maintains a lot of the poetic language and the poetic integrity of the story. It's not the easiest translation to read. It's certainly not just in standard prose, but I, I don't think it really needed to be. I'm gonna put this in C because first of all, it's not actually Tolkien's writing. And second of all, it's not like the cleanest translation ever. There's some weird things, and especially for a beginner Tolkien person, again, this would not be my baby's first Tolkien experience. But speaking of something that could be baby's first Tolkien, let's talk about Leaf by Niggle. Leaf by Niggle is again, one that I have done a full reading of. This one was particularly fun for me. I was sitting out by a creek and there are geese and ducks that land and that video was a lot of fun to film. But this story is about a painter who is working on his life's masterpiece, a giant painting of a tree, but he keeps getting interrupted and unable to finish his work. And he's kind of a 
perfectionist and a little bit obsessed with every final detail of this tree. And so, when it comes time for him to leave on a long journey from which he will not return, he is unable to finish the painting. After some time in basically like a work camp, the higher ups eventually decide that he has had enough and he is too tired to keep working. And so they send him off to a place where he can finally be happy. Another world in which his tree that he has worked on for his entire life is a reality. You know, once he gets there, his cranky old neighbor from back when he was alive, spoiler alert, he, he is dead in this analogy, his cranky neighbor back from when he was alive shows up and, you know, first they, they fight and argue and bicker and then they realize that working together they can perfect this tree in this realm of the tree in a way that Niggle alone never would have been able to. It is a beautiful allegory for the artist's life and how sometimes they can get caught up in perfecting what they want to make instead of, you know, working and seeing the great wide world and everything feels like an interruption and it's all so annoying because you just want to keep working. But Tolkien shows us that there's more than that, that maybe once we're gone, we will be able to see our works realized in a way that our earthly minds could never comprehend. This feels like a very personal piece for Tolkien. I mean, he was never able to finish the Silmarillion because he was still, you know, picking over details until the day that he died. And this artistic perfectionism really seems to have been both a help and a hindrance throughout his career. We have only had one A tier thus far, and I think that Leaf by Niggle deserves to also be an A tier. It's a great read, it's short, it's simple, but if you are an artist or an author or any type of creative person or any type of a person, to be honest. I think it is a very valuable read. Next, let's talk about Farmer Giles of Ham, which tells us the tale of, obviously, Farmer Giles, who lives in Ham. It's a short story and very much a storybook feel, which tells us about this cranky farmer who ends up accidentally sort of defeating a giant and then accidentally becomes the hero of the land. Of course, once he has established himself as a hero, then he has to face off against a dragon, which is uh, less than ideal because uh, he doesn't know how to fight, but he is able to use his kind of homegrown wit and wisdom to outsmart the dragon. He chases the useless king out of the land and the dragon Chrysophylax becomes his friend. It's so fun. There's lots of little Tolkienisms. I did do a video reading this, by the way, a while back. Um, so if you want to check that out, he has references to like the dictionary that he had been working at the time. So it's so, so very Tolkien. The dragon is a hoot and a half. His name is Chrysophylax. He's a very, very fun character and like kind of like Smaug light. The whole story is very enjoyable. It's not the most compelling or moving of Tolkien's works, but it is a really fun read and it's especially good for kids. There are illustrations for it by Pauline Baines that are very pseudo medieval and they're really fun. So I highly recommend this. Is it the best of his works? No. I'm gonna put this in D, especially because that means it's with The Adventures of Tom Pompadil, which it reminds me of a lot, where it is not as consequential as a lot of his other short stories, but it is still a ton of fun and you can get a lot out of it. It's very Tolkien. Next up is Roverandum, which is another one of Tolkien's children's stories written for his children. It tells us about a dog named Rover, who later on gets called Roverandum, hence the title, who is turned by a witch or a wizard can't remember exactly, but he is transformed into a tiny toy dog where he is purchased by a boy and brought to a beach and then he's dropped at the beach, but then he is able to turn back into a dog because there's a little sand warlock there. But the sand warlock doesn't turn him back into a full-size dog. It turns him from a tiny toy dog into um, a tiny real dog. And then he goes on adventures, including seeing the moon. It's a very sweet story. At one point I read it to my rats. Check that out here. I swear this video isn't just a plug for my other videos. It's just a lot of these short stories I've talked about before. Roverandum is another one that he wrote for his children. I believe it was because one of his sons lost their toy dog on the beach. So he wanted to make him feel better by telling him a story of his toy dog going on wild adventures and making friends with moon dogs. This one is kind of in the vein of like letters from Father Christmas, where it feels very personal. Let's put Roverandum to B. It's fun, very Tolkien. 
as Tolkien works are often wont to do. Next up, let's chat about Baron and Luthien. Baron and Luthien was one of my first introductions to the larger lore of Tolkien, and I really fell in love with it quick. He had a couple versions of the story written out, some of them in poetry, some of them in prose, and lots of outlines, so we know how the whole story goes, but he never like wrote out a fully complete and publishable version, but Christopher Tolkien compiled all of the notes and everything and did publish that as a separate book. If you want to check that out, that would probably be the best way to do it, but the tale is also told in the Silmarillion. The Lay of Lathion, or the Tale of Baron and Luthien, tells us the tale of Luthien, an elven maiden who is the most beautiful woman in the entire world. She's the daughter of a Maya, which is basically an angel, and she is like a point of beauty that every beautiful person in Middle-earth from here on out will be compared to. So like Arwen has some of the beauty of Luthien, and she looks a lot like Luthien because she's related to her, but that's a story for another day. Luthien falls in love with a human princeling named Baron. She's dancing in the forest and he sees her and it's, it is so romantic. And in order to win her hand, Baron has to go and pry one of the Silmarils from the crown of Morgoth. That's big daddy bad guy himself. And of course, Luthien chases after him because she's not gonna let her man risk his life without her being there to help him. And it's way too much story for me to fully summarize here, but we get a lot of fabulous girl power from Luthien. She has a magical voice and magical dancing skills and can put people to sleep. And Baron is really great too. Skip forward like 10 seconds if you don't want spoilers, but Baron gets his hand cut off and then he dies and Luthien has to plead with the God of the underworld to get his soul back. And she does, and they're able to live happily ever after as a mortal couple. So just living one mortal lifetime instead of her immortal lifetime that she would have had. The story of Baron and Luthien is very epic and it feels very much like a myth. It feels like a poetic lay akin to Beowulf, which it was intended to, which is why he wrote some versions of it, which are in verse, so they rhyme and there's poetic rhythm and stuff. This is also a story that gets referenced a lot in The Lord of the Rings because it's very evocative of the romance between Aragorn and Arwen, and pretty much any love story, any any beautiful woman pretty much will be compared to Beren and Luthien and their Beautiful, beautiful story. This also seems to have been particularly personally important to Tolkien as he has Baron and Luthien written on the grave of he and his wife Edith. So, you know, Edith was his Luthien and this story seems like it was very important to him because he worked on it a lot. There are a lot of different versions of it. To me, this story shows the range of Tolkien and what he was truly capable of because I think it is one of his most expansive, one of his most evocative, beautiful stories. For me, at least, this one's definitely an S tier. One of my favorite stories and I will be thinking about it until the day I die. All right, it is time to break out the big guns, and that is talking about the Silmarillion, or as I call it with my co-workers, the Silly Marillion. The Silmarillion is basically Tolkien's entire backlog of legendarium. It is a compilation of all of his notes, all of his musings about the backstory of the Lord of the Rings, kind of leading up to the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. This is arguably his life's work. It's what he first started working on when he was in the trenches of the First World War, when he first started creating Middle Earth, and it's something that he toyed with for the rest of his life. He was never able to fully finish it to get it into a form that he saw as publishable, but his son Christopher Tolkien compiled everything and edited it together to publish posthumously. I love the Silmarillion. I think it is beautiful. That first chapter, the Ainulindale, the creation of Middle-earth, is some of the most beautiful writing that I've ever seen. And the sections of this that were polished up, that were completed by Tolkien, are just beautiful. The problem is that some of it does read like a history textbook. And this isn't necessarily a problem. I mean, that that's basically what it is meant to be. But I don't necessarily know if I would rank it as the most enjoyable. It's like a Bible for Middle Earth, and some people very much enjoy reading the Bible. But not everyone is gonna, you know, pull that out to read with a glass of wine on a Saturday night. I have done that, but... Um, that's because that's my job. I am going to rank the Silmarillion lower than probably some people would have it. I think I'm probably going to put it at a C. It's not because it is bad. I, I very much enjoy it. And when it is good, it is so, 
so good, it's just there are some parts of it that you can tell that Tolkien didn't finish writing. Moving on in-universe chronologically, we have the Hobbit. If you're here on this channel, I assume you probably know what The Hobbit is, so I won't waste too much time summarizing it, but it is the precursor to The Lord of the Rings. It started out as a children's story that he was telling to his children, and then steadily got written down and edited and changed to become The Hobbit. I think one of my favorite things about The Hobbit is, is the world that we get to see, because it is Middle Earth, but it is also very specifically Middle Earth through a children's eye. Because when he was originally writing The Hobbit, he was not necessarily planning on having it become this big, dramatic world that we see in The Lord of the Rings. It's a world where Sauron is probably present in retrospect, but we don't see that. It's a world where we just get to have a fun adventure, a fun romp. And if you have not read The Hobbit, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a children's book, but it's also a Tolkien children's book, which basically means that there's less people dying violent deaths and he puts more jokes in. So for me, that makes it all the better. Bilbo is really such a standout character. I mean, it's called The Hobbit. I should hope that his character is pretty good, but he is such a force to be reckoned with. And you can really see like he is the exemplary Hobbit. He is the Hobbit, obviously. And Hobbits are such a unique and enduring creation for Tolkien. I think they are probably the most important thing that he created when he made Middle Earth. Because without Bilbo, I think The Hobbit could have been relatively pedestrian, but when you get like Bilbo interacting with Smaug, it's just such excellent writing. And you can really see that even in writing a children's story, Tolkien puts everything he has in it. And The Hobbit is such a great example of this. For me, I'm gonna put The Hobbit in S tier. There's sirens. I don't know if that's coming to arrest me for putting the Silmarillion in C tier, but. Next up, let's talk about Fellowship. It is gonna be kind of hard to talk about each individual book of The Lord of the Rings because they're now really individual books. They're kind of meant to be one overarching story. But The Fellowship obviously is the first step of the journey. There's a lot of great stuff in Fellowship. That's where we get the introduction to hobbits and to the Shire, and he extrapolates on a lot of things that he first brought up in the Hobbit books and really takes it a step further. Here we also get the introduction of Tom Bombadil as a character. We get to meet Aragorn, we get to meet Legolas and Gimli and Boromir. This is where Boromir's pretty much entire character arc, except for a little bit of Two Towers. This is where all of that happens. It is very much action-packed, solid. It's gonna be A tier. It's very nearly an S, but I don't wanna put too many things in the S tier, if I'm being honest. So I'm gonna have it in A. The Two Towers, I am also gonna put in A. I like the Two Towers. It's where we get a lot of the action. For me, there aren't as many moments that I like adore in the Two Towers, but like that's also where we get the Ents and Helm's Deep, which is such a fun battle. I mean, it's the Two Towers. It's so good. For me, when I was little, the Two Towers movie was definitely my favorite because that's where we get Rohan and all of Eowyn's pretty dresses. And I was a big Eowyn fan when I was little, but the book itself, I'll, I'll leave it a solid A. I mean, it's, it's very good. Return of the King, Return of the King is gonna go S tier. I have more fondness for the Fellowship of the Ring, but Return of the King is undeniably just an insanely, insanely good book. And that's not a hot take. Uh, you know, it's one of the best sellers. It's one of the best sellers. It's just one of the best sellers. It's sold very well. The ending and all of its you catastrophic glory is just incredible. Like you, you, it doesn't get better than the extended endings of The Return of the King. I love it. I love it so much. It's hard to say goodbye to these characters that we've been with through so much, but it is also such a beautiful way to say goodbye to them. Return of the King is gonna be S tier. So here we have our tier list. I don't know what it looks like. It probably looks very top heavy, uh, but you know, I did my best. I'm not gonna rank any Lord of the Rings works as F tier. I'm not insane um, and I would like to stay alive on the internet. Honestly, I don't think any of them really deserve it. Tolkien was an excellent and prolific writer who put all of himself into everything that he created. And anything from this backlog is a very enjoyable read. Even the things that I rated a little bit lower, it is not because they're not enjoyable, it's just because they're not as enjoyable as they possibly could be. Looking at this list, I think I am intrigued by how it is dominated by 
children's works and children's stories. I feel like a lot of people think of Tolkien as Middle Earth, as the Lord of the Rings, as this incredible world builder, which of course he was, but he also wrote a lot more. And things like Mr. Bliss, Smith of Wooten Major, or Leaf by Niggle, I think that having those be overlooked in favor of an intense and dark legendarium, I think that's really a mistake. Because we have to remember that it all started with The Hobbit. It all started with a children's story. And I think his passion was of course in world building, but it was also very much in creating beautiful stories for people of all ages that allow us to dream, to imagine, and to make our lives feel bigger than the everyday mundane. And a lot of these works do a beautiful, beautiful job at that. I would love to hear what your rankings are for any of these. If you heavily disagree with any of them, please let me know. And I really want to hear how you guys rank Fellowship, Two Towers, and Return of the King, because that was probably the hardest for me, because they kind of all mesh together in my brain. So I want to know what your rankings would be for the three of those, as well as anything else on this list. Like this video if you enjoyed it, and if you want to hear me talk about all of these works that I discussed today, you should subscribe so that you never miss another video. I really appreciate you guys bearing with me this week. I've been doing a lot of really, really research heavy stuff. Um, in the past and coming up and so it's been nice just to sit back a little bit and relax for this one. Thank you all so much for joining me this week and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day. <laughs> <laughs>